So uh, Rachel Berger, Rachel Deppa, and Lynn Hazelman, why don't you come over here? And we're going to start our Tacony Dyslexia board panel interview. So I will let them briefly introduce themselves in 30 seconds or less. Rachel, why don't you go first? Yeah. Okay. I'm Rachel Berger. I reside in Hugo in Senator Chamberlain's district, and I uh, founded and lead this movement uh, with Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota. It's been uh, six years now. So. Hi, I'm Lynn Hazelman, and I reside here in uh, White Bear Township, actually. Um, but my district is White Bear Lake here. Um, and I'm a former early childhood administrator. I um, am in private practice now. And dyslexia has uh, been in my family for as long as I can remember. So my brother had it, and I recognized that when my son was a peanut, and now he's graduated from high school, and you know, that's where we're at. <laughs> And I am Rachel Deppa. Um, I am from Delano, so about as far west as you really want to go. Um, I am a school board member out there. I always like to say I talk with my experience as a school board member, not on behalf of my board, because that gets me in trouble. And I have six kids, one of them who's back there and should be sitting down and is not. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go ahead and start with Rachel Berger. Please give a brief history of decoding dyslexia locally and nationally and highlight its accomplishments. Okay, um, I'm gonna start with nationally. So fall of 2011, I'm not sure how many of you guys know this or not, uh, but in fall of 2011, um, eight individuals share a train ride from New Jersey to New York City for a National Center of Learning Disabilities conference. Those eight parents uh, uh, during that train ride talked about dyslexia and why wasn't there anyone out there doing anything and uh, basically essentially you know kind of kvetched about the issue the whole ride there and once they returned um, from the conference they decided on the train ride home well maybe we should be those individuals so they started decoding dyslexia in New Jersey 2011 uh, late fall and then by the time um, and then they had other people kind of mushrooming up asking, you know, hey, how do we get involved in our state? So by 2013, um, Minnesota, I uh, raised my hand and said, you know, hey, I'm not sure what you guys are doing, but uh, make me a foot soldier somehow and, <laughs> and we'll drive some change. So Minnesota was lucky state number 13. And by the end of 2013, all 50 states in the movement had leadership um, and momentum moving forward to uh, bring change for dyslexia. 22 states had laws on the books at the time um, pre-decoding -dys dyslexia national movement. Laws that maybe um, to some degree were either being implemented or maybe, maybe not. There's that whole compliance thing that Amy likes to um, remind us of. So 22 <laughs> states. Um, here's a little fact right now. There are only um, less than seven states that do not have policy on the books for dyslexia. Um, and between January and March of 2018, 33 bills were introduced by Decoding Dyslexia as a national movement. So that's pretty exciting stuff on a national level, high level, in terms of Decoding Dyslexia. For us, um, we all share a united mission, and it's that the Decoding Dyslexia is a Grassroots movement driven by families, educators, and other professionals who are concerned with the limited access to dyslexia-specific interventions within our educational environments. Um, we strive to build dyslexia awareness, empower families to support their children, and um, improve resources for students with dyslexia, in, again, within their educational environments. Policy goals that everyone in the national movement shares is that dyslexia would be defined in state statute. Um, the reason I want to spend a second on that is that's a cornerstone piece. Many of you may have been part of this, but uh, pre-having in Minnesota a statute that said, hey, it's legal to have dyslexia here, um, <laughs> you, <were, laughs> you might have been met by a hand or uh, some level of dismissal to say dyslexia doesn't exist. So that was a very important cornerstone piece here in Minnesota and as well across the nation. It's important to have that recognition that, that it exists and it is a learning disability. Um, early identification of dyslexia, early effective interventions for dyslexia, 
Um, educator professional development, as you know, we've talked about free service and in-service opportunities. And then access to assistive technology, both within the gen ed classrooms and within special education. I could ask you another one on the subject, or we could hop around a little bit. Let me catch my breath. OK. Um, let's go ahead to Rachel Deppa. And as she talked about, she speaks from her experiences as a school board member. And could you talk briefly about that arena? Oh, how it works. A, so a lot of parents will come and they'll ask the question, how do I get my school board to make my superintendent and my principal do what I need them to do? The reality is, as a school board member, I can't do a thing for you except make policy. Right, so we institute policy, then we look to the superintendent to take that policy out to the individual districts, and then we look at the administrators at the district level to implement it, and then it comes back up to us. So I can't go to, like for my daughter, I can't say, she needs OG in her first grade classroom. They just look at me and go, whatever. Like, and so I always tell parents, I'm a board member in my own district and I can't get what I need. So good luck. But I can tell you, <laughs> is that when you come to a board and you're ready to talk to a board member, come in there prepared, have a couple people with you. Um, I always say if there's five or more in the room, it's something important. Um, usually for school boards, we sit in a room and we see nobody. We can go through our meeting really quickly. It's really nice. If we see five parents in a room, we know it's an issue. Um, we don't respond to people who are in the, at the board meeting. We're not allowed to. So you can come to me and you can talk for five minutes and my answer can be, Thanks for your comments. That's all I'm allowed to do. I'm not allowed to make a decision there. No other board member's allowed to make a decision. But what we do afterwards is we'll go up to a school administrator, we'll usually hit the superintendent first or the director of teaching and learning, and say, all right, what are you doing? Why do I have five people in this board meeting? Right, because that's uncomfortable. So what are you doing to make sure this doesn't happen again? And then we'll usually walk up to those parents afterwards and say, hey, you've got my phone number. If something doesn't happen, give me a call and I will call them again, and I will push again. I can't go into the classroom and do it, but I can do it by intervening. Sometimes I'll go to IEP meetings with parents because they feel like they're not being listened to. And I've done that a few times where, all right, you're not getting listened to. If I come in, maybe that'll help put a little bit of pressure on the administration to at least hear what you're saying and give me a decent answer as to why they're not doing what needs to be done. Um, it, it's a local control issue. It's usually fixable. We've seen a lot of change in our district just from pressure from parents, pressure from parents. But I can tell you if you call out a specific teacher, it will be shut down. Like as a board member, once you start saying, Mrs. Johnson is the worst teacher for my dyslexic child, I have to stop your conversation at that point because now we're going into staff personnel issues and that's private. It's also private about your child. So now you're telling everybody in the city that your kid has a disability and which of your kids has one. And so we have to shut those conversations down and that's done on a personal level. Did that answer any of your questions or did I, I just go excellent. off on my own? I have more, but if you want to expand, go ahead. Um, I, could you just touch on funding and change and continued education for funding. teachers and how that Ooh. pool is distributed? Well, if Roger would give special ed more money and fund the federal government. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. So actually what happens is, and this is what a lot of parents don't understand is, the state of Minnesota has actually stepped up to the plate and covered a lot of the special ed funding that the feds promised us and they don't give us. So I live in a small district, there's about 2,900 kids on a good day. Um, we spend a million dollars in special ed cross subsidy, which is the money that the federal government promised us that they just didn't bother to pay. And so that comes out of the money for everybody else's kids. So if you have a kid who has dyslexia, who's got a 504, but they're not in special ed, that funding that I could have been using that didn't come from the state to get a Orton Gillingham training for professional development got moved over to special ed because I have to cover the cross subsidy because that's federally mandated. And so it's, it's actually not in the state. Like we give the state reps and Senate a lot of feedback on what we think they should be covering above and beyond their obligation. But it actually turns out it's just that the federal government promises 40% and I don't think they've ever gotten close to it. Usually like 17%. Um, so any kid with a 504, your funding for that is gonna come out of your general fund. It's not gonna come out of special ed dollars. A kid with an IEP, that comes out of special ed dollars and that's federally mandated and those services have to happen. Um, and so there's a difference in how that happens. Money from your special ed fund 
cannot cross over into general funds. So if for some reason the heavens parted and we got a ton of special ed funding and it was more than we needed, it's never going to happen, <laughs> ever. That money can go to, back to the general fund to repay what we've taken out of it. And so parents get really confused because they're like, your district brings in $61 million in this much money. Well, right, but there's funds and that money can't cross those six fund lines. The only thing that can go anywhere is general fund money. Um, and so if you really want to talk about funding and where the money goes, catch me later and I'll just bore you instead of all of you. <laughs> Excellent, done. Yeah, eighty percent of your kids in special ed are going to have probably a dyslexia diagnosis. Well, all of your special ed funding is going to come from special ed funding, right? Except for what? It's oh, how many of your like? Yep. Okay, so the, what, what they're talking about there is when we have special ed funding for kids who require a one-on-one -on -one para, right? That's going to cost me as a district a lot more than it is going to cost me to have a teacher teaching Orton Gillingham to your child for one hour a day. And so that's what they're talking about there. Um, and that's just determined by the special ed evaluation. Um, most of your dyslexic kids, unless they have another qualifying disability, aren't going to need a one-on-one -on -one para, right? They're just not. Um, in my district, it's actually better to keep my kid out of special ed because my trained teachers aren't in special ed. They're in Title I, which is easier to get into and saves the district money. Um, usually when parents talk about I can't get my district to do an evaluation, remind them it's going to cost them $1,200 to do a special ed evaluation. It's cost them three or four bucks to check and see if my kid's got dyslexia and put them in the right room. Like, those are some real numbers to a district. Because parents don't know, right? There's online screeners they can use for free. Um, my district's using one right now. My Title I teacher can take a kid, do the online screener, and say, hey, this kid shows characteristics of dyslexia. We have three teachers who went outside and got their own training. Let's put them in that classroom. Let's look at the success that way versus a $1,200 evaluation that requires my principal, my assistant principal, my nurse, my psychologist, my everybody else to sit in a meeting because teachers love meetings. They love staying after school for an extra half hour to hang out with you or coming an hour early to hang out with you. No, they'd rather just do the screening. Why can't there be like a closed academy in every district? It's expensive. <laughs> okay, so Title I's a state program, right? And so when a kid qualifies for Title I, it's usually the bottom percentage of your reading kids. So for, right, so they can't qualify for special ed. So they're not your lowest of the low, but they're lower than your average. And so like in our school, we have actually three tiers. We've got special ed, we've got ADSYS, we've got reading core, we've got title one, and we've got our general ed kids. Which ironically, our title one kids in Delano are usually 25% below the top because we don't have a lot in that lower tier. So a kid who's reading at 75% of the rest of the school is probably gonna end up at title one. It's just their higher readings. Because I'm like, hey, my kid parred the course. Why is she in Title I? She's got 75%. No, it's just they take that bottom chunk and they get them the extra services to get them up there. Um, so it depends on who you have in your school. Inner city districts are going to have a lot more lower kids just by sheer numbers. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little harder to get them into those classes. <coughs> Small suburban schools, we don't have the numbers. So excellent information. And um, I've got lots more questions for you. But we're going to move on to Lynn just to stay on target here. <laughs> Lynn, could you share your comments regarding higher education and the perspective of teachers? <coughs> sure, I can. Light questions to start things with. Right, thanks. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of teachers in here. In fact, I've met a few teachers in here. And um, you know, I'll just give you the background from my teaching when I, was in, when I was in college and when I learned how to get into the classroom. I, I was never given any structured literacy tools. It, it was mind-blowing to me when my son was dyslexic and they said, and here's what you need to do. You need to go 
find a Norton Gillingham tutor, and I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Um, and when I finally started to understand the science of reading and the, <laughs> and how structured language works, it, it blew my mind. And what blew my mind was not only how important it was, but also that I never had the opportunity to learn it. And it wasn't that I didn't want to learn it, it's that I was never given that opportunity. They never required a single course. Now, I had to learn how to structure a gym class, even though I was never going to teach gym. But I was going to teach reading, and I was going to teach it all the time. But I was given kind of an overview, and I was, I was taught whole language. So it didn't help me in the classroom. It really didn't help me, and it didn't help my students, and it's, it's a shame. And so I think that if you talk to some of the teachers in the room, you'll hear that same story, which is, it's not that we didn't want to learn it. We weren't given that chance. And we do hear that over and over and over again from teachers throughout the state. So as we start clamoring for teachers to know better and do better, they do, and they want to. But the pressure needs to come, as, as um, Senator Chamberlain and Dr. Schulting were alluding to, there's other players in this game that need to be held accountable, and, and that's higher ed, and that is, I think, Senator Chamberlain of Steep Hill to climb. It's, it is. Um, those, are, those are some big people that need to step up to the plate that really in some arenas don't acknowledge that there's a problem and that they think they're doing very, very well by their teachers. So, And Lynn, I'm just gonna interject a quick question here. Sure. So if a teacher comes to a parent and says, I'm interested in learning more, what would your words of advice be? A teacher comes to a parent mm -hmm. and asks. <laughs> yeah. And ask the parents. And ask the parents, ask the parents what parents. should I do? What should I do? Um, I, I go back to my district. So I go back to my district and I would, I would say I need structured literacy. So you're gonna hear me use the term structured literacy versus Orton-Gillingham because Orton-Gillingham does send the cockles up on, on administrators every now and then. So I use the term structured literacy, okay? And I do mean Orton-Gillingham, science of reading, whatever you wanna call it, Wilson, Barton, on and on. Um, all of those. I, I would go back to my principal, I would go back to my administration, I would go back to my literacy team, and that's who I would, I would say, I need this training, clearly I'm, I, I don't have the tools in my tool belt. And then write a letter to your higher education. Then write a letter to your higher education, okay. and maybe Senator Chamberlain, and. So the question, so I apologize. Um, so when my son was in, I think, third grade, the, his um, special ed teacher said, Orton Gillingham would be the best to teach him, but I can't teach it in school, so you're gonna have to, you know, I know how to do it, but you're gonna have to pay for my services outside of school. So even if the teachers say that they want to learn it, I mean, and they do learn it, can they teach it in the schools then? Okay, student? so, I mean, here's one thing that you have to know about. I'm gonna give you less than a minute to answer okay. that question. Okay, Orton Gillingham, it's, it's, a, it's a methodology it's not owned by anybody. And so when you talk about the politics of what happens sometimes, you're talking about it not being owned. There's no lobbyist. There's nobody that can benefit from Orton Gillingham and the structure of science of reading. Okay, so it's not owned. It's, there's no lobbyist. There's none of that stuff. So that's where the politics of these things come into play a little bit. So. I think any teacher who has Orton-Gillingham background would naturally teach Orton-Gillingham. It's just part of your being. It's just who you are. You just have the rules. You know the rules. You would fire them off and you would do that. And when you found a bad worksheet or a bad spelling rule, you would throw it out and you would be like, no, this is how you'd need to think about this word or this language or this is why that word makes sense and this doesn't make sense. To me, that's more of like the fiber of your being, and I don't know how you would separate the two. Okay. Because once I understood what I was doing, you know, I feel like Oprah. Once I knew better, I had to do better. And that's kind of where I continue with that. And I, I think most teachers, once they know better, they would do better because 
they care. I mean, uh, they do. And Senator Chamberlain just gave me a really nice transition, wrote me, passed me a note. Addressing dyslexia will have a dramatic positive impact on special education and FYI, we are working on a suit of bills to reform special education, making more efficiently and save money. So I'm gonna turn it back to Rachel Berger. And I'd like you to touch on who our champions are and tell us a little bit about um, leading the charge now for six years. Tell us about the level of volunteerism involved and what DDMN prides itself in. Three part question. That's three questions, yeah. It is three. <laughs> okay. So you guys heard from Senator Chamberlain, and he is, um, as he mentioned, uh, we met early. Um, just so you know, it's, it wasn't just a bar. It's a bar and a restaurant. So <laughs> and while he had whiskey, I was good and had a Diet Coke. So um, he might have a different memory of that. Maybe he really wanted to drink a lot of whiskey after he, I told him what I did. But <laughs> at any rate. Um, early on, um, and this is also part of a, fun, a funny part of our story in meeting, he initially thought um, that our children, my child specifically we were talking about, was served in special education and there are resources. And um, he was going to do some research into that and give me some resources so that I could get better help. And so he did come back to me a couple weeks later with some resources and I said, no, I don't think you get it. I don't, I don't think, you know, I. We need to sit down again. And so when I didn't really go away, um, then he, uh, and he really came to understanding what the issue is, and you know, it was well illustrated to him, then um, he was very interested in helping um, our cause and children, and I'm not saying he wasn't interested before, but once it really kind of um, hit him exactly how difficult this is, um, he decided that this was something he was gonna champion. And very early on, he pulled uh, uh, Representative Linda Runbeck into um, representing the issue with him and Senator Greg Claussen. So very early on, those three individuals were at the table with us discussing the issue, talking about how could we um, impact uh, dyslexia in our educational environments for our kids. Along the way, we have gained a lot of support on both sides of the aisle, so we've had, um, and, and these are just some that come to the top of mind right now, Senator Weger, um, Senator Nelson, Senator Hoffman, Senator Pratt, um, Representative Barb Haley, Representative um, Erickson, and Daniels, and Ward, I mean, pretty much, um, a lot of different representatives, um, maybe even some of your own. And so we've, we've got some great support. We've really illustrated the issue and um, feel really good about where we're going, but it isn't just as easy as getting support and having people who want to do something. There's a lot of things at play at the Capitol during each session. Um, so it's a lot of work to do. I'm sorry, Erin, where, where else was I on? Who are our champions? Well, you kind of hit on the champions. Um, also, regarding the power of constituents, I think you're making a good example using yourself right there. Oh, that's different. Um, so that one, and then... You want to, um, oh, volunteerism, you said. The volunteerism and uh, the things about defining dyslexia accomplishments. So, sure. Volunteerism, um, let's just say that initially when I raised my hand and said, we're, we're going to start a group here in Minnesota, and I know I've got some people that um, you know, will be on board to helping champion the cause and, and um, you know, move things forward, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, however, I, I, at the time, I think I had been about 14 years into serving on my city commission. So I had some idea that things are not just easy, it's not an overnight process. I mean, I remember when we did um, pass policy and, and put everything into place for the Hannibal Fields north of here. I mean, that took five years and someone wrote us a check. So I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't happen overnight. I could say that, um, you know, when I think about my board members and those that have, um, you know, been around the last six years, walk in the halls between the Senate and the House and camping out during session, the four months of session, and the amount of time and energy that goes into that. Um, I've got close to um, 2,300 hours wrapped up into just 16 weeks of session for six years. That's just me. Um, so that's a, that's a lot of time and volunteerism um, 
to, to make sure that this issue is represented, to make sure that we keep it at the table, um, and, and from the grass tops, make sure we're, we're continuing to build momentum and do what we need to do. Um, it's not an overnight process, it's not an easy process, and it's definitely not a process for the faint of heart. Um, Did you want to make any other comments about changes at the Capitol this year? Changes at the Capitol? Uh, Robert kind of, Roger took care of it, so. Yeah. Let's hand it over to Rachel Deba. We have two Rachels and two Kimberleys in our group, so lots of last names. Would you share your thoughts about what parents need to consider when developing a game plan for their district and how to respond to those? When they want to do something. Oh, if you want to make to changes. What steps Got they it. should take. It's just playing catch up here. Um, <laughs> so I was thinking about what Roger said about higher ed. And one of the things that we as a district are is we're the consumer of higher ed. Right? And so if you want to see your district make changes, push your district to push higher ed, right? Because who's buying all those teachers that they're putting out? It's the district. And we've seen it with some of the colleges nearby us when we stopped taking their student teachers. And they said, why? We said, well, this is the issues with the teachers you're putting out. Well, all of a sudden, those local schools start to make some changes with the teachers they're putting out to make them more appealing to us. Um, it's one of those things where your, your higher ed students need a job. Higher ed has to put out somebody that's valuable to me as a school board and somebody that's valuable to my district. So when we push our administration and you go in there and you say, hey, your teacher's not trained. Your teacher's not trained. Why are you not hiring trained teachers? Well, the administration starts to look for those trained teachers and they're like, well, they're not out there. So then they start to talk to the higher ed schools that we work with. And a lot of schools use the same places to get their student teachers and stuff like that. Um, and when they start saying, why aren't you giving me somebody with this skill set? Why don't I have this skill set? Do you know what you're costing me in special ed dollars to do evaluations, to see if these kids can come in or not to special ed, and then I've got to get more teachers for Title I. Why are you not giving me a product that I can use in my general ed classroom that will service all of my students? And the district looks at that kind of response and we say, hey, you're not asking me to put out a whole lot of more money right now. You're asking me to push somebody to do what needs to be done to give me a better product. Um, when it comes to your specific child in your classroom, right, you don't want to wait for higher ed five, six years down the road to get something done. Start with your teacher. There's nothing worse to an administrator than somebody who skipped the teacher. There's nothing worse to a school board member than someone who ch skipped that chain of command and came right to me. Um, and so I always say start with your teacher. I've yet to meet a teacher who doesn't want your kid to read and who would really like your kid to be the pain in the back of the classroom. They really love those kids who are up and down, up and down. They want your kid to read. They want them to be successful. You start with the teacher. Sometimes, like with my son, we weren't getting it through the teacher, and I told the principal, I said, I'm going to be in your office every day until you move my kid. It took like a month. He gave up. Moved my kid. I had nothing better to do. I'm a stay-at-home mom, so I could do that. But, you know, it was, <laughs> I just kept coming every day. When are you going to move him? When are you going to move him? When are you going to move him? He doesn't belong in there. Um, after you get to the administrator, a lot of schools have a director of teacher, teaching and learning. Or they have a, if your child's not an IEP, your special ed director's really not going to help you, right? She has nothing to do with that. So go to your director of teacher and learning and say, what are you doing? Show me specifically what you're doing to help my kid, right? Because my kid has a right to learn to read. And a lot of parents don't know this, but a 504 is a lot easier to obtain than an IEP. You can get a lot of stuff in a 504. You've got a lot of power with a 504 because you don't have to sign off on it until you get to the point where you feel comfortable. So my child's 504, both of them say that they can't be taken out of their services for learning to read, right? Because I don't want you, my, my child's 504 says they cannot be pulled from their services for learning to read at grade level. Now, if they get above grade level, our concern was my son Isaiah, he would get to grade level and they would try to pull his services and wait for him to drop again. We don't allow that. In his 504, he has to be one grade above grade level before they can consider pulling his services because I didn't want him to fail. I, you have a lot of power in those meetings, right? Because administrators want you to be happy. They want your kid to learn to read. And not every district's gonna concede to that. We actually did that before I got on the board. My district was willi willing to work with me and get me out of the office. And so they gave me that for both of my children. Yeah, you can develop. You have so much power you don't know you have, right? Parents are part of your 504 team. 
market. In our district, our parents are always involved in the 504 planning. Well, they would be best And so, they did not have to sign off on the 504? Parents have to sign off on the 504. Yeah, typically you're involved. You'd still have to sign off on the 504. Um, because I have to sign off on my child's 504 every year. Let me look into that and we'll, when I'm done, I can email my director of teaching and learning and find out how bored he is today. So I'm going to wrap that question up um, since Rachel can get back to us on that particular one. Um, let's go back to Rachel Berger. Okay. Lynn, Lynn looks really like she's ready, though. Okay. I've got more questions for you. <laughs> uh, comments on what attendance at the rally accomplishes. Ah, got it. Um, well, I think this is a really great question, um, and one that automatically invokes a lot of emotion for me. Uh, it's one of the days that, I, and I'm speaking just for myself, I'm not speaking for our entire board, but I would have to imagine they feel the same way, but it's one that um, holds really dear in my heart. It's the one day a year that um, people from near and far who support the issue can take action. They can be part of a united community, and they can raise awareness for dyslexia, but also have their voices heard. Um, I think they also learn a lot of advocacy, advocacy skills and um, citizen rights. And then for children, um, the, the fabric of our being, the reason that we exist um, at Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota, I've seen personally how attending the rally impacts children in an incredibly positive way. Oftentimes, uh, they feel incredibly, and, and you guys know this, they feel isolated, they feel stigmatized. They come to us at the rally and with other, you know, in, in other areas of life, completely feeling hopeless and oftentimes depressed. And when they come to the rally and realize this issue is bigger than themselves as an individual, and they can see that there's a community for them of children just like them, it's empowering, it builds confidence, it builds a sense of pride for them. And um, I just think it's incredibly amazing to watch how this impacts the kids, um, not just that one day and that one moment, but year round and the stories that I hear from parents afterwards on what that does for their children. If that says, I see some of you nodding and, and some of you are individuals that you've been there. If that says anything again about the importance of t attending, not just to attend and shout you know, about dyslexia, but really what it does as a sense of community and um, for your children and for everyone. I would encourage you to come and be part of that and bring everybody in near and dear to you as well. So I took a picture because I wish you could see your faces because this is the stuff that gels us here together. Moving on, uh, let's give the microphone to Lynn. And could you touch on what's going right in Minnesota? Um, I think what's going right in Minnesota is right here in this room. This is new and this is unique. Um, and to bring people from across our state, which is really, this is the slice of Minnesota here in, in our room here. Um, this, is going, this is going well and I think that the comments and the messages and the what can we do and all of those kinds of things are, that's, it's, it's, I, Rachel always uses the term like, we got to turn the big wheel and I think the big wheel is starting to turn a little bit, right? <laughs> okay, so it is because we're getting the attention that this, reading and dyslexia deserves and that's good um i think that we have some really impassioned legislators i think that's going well i think we have some people on all sides of the both sides of the party that are understand the issue well that are there to support us and um they they have helped make some of those changes happen but mostly i think it's, it's the people that are here um, and that are going back to their districts and putting the pressure on their districts and higher ed and informing other parents and making a network. That's what's going well. Rachel Deppa. 
On the topic of laws and education, what challenges are schools facing when it comes to FAPE? You know, it, as a district, I don't think we face the challenges based on the laws. Um, we face the challenges based on funding. Right? And so when we talk about special ed funding eating up a million dollars of my small budget or $2.8 million of the neighboring district's budget, those are the challenges we face. So we make a lot of federal laws regarding special ed, and they're not funded. And so even if my district wants to take money and put it into things like OG training or professional development, which is a big chunk of our budget, we can't do it when we have to provide things that we, we just don't have a choice. We have to provide them. So there's not a lot of options um, where our money goes. Um, the laws that we've seen come down through decoding dyslexia in the state level aren't really a big deal to the districts, right? We're talking small amounts of money. We're talking about you know recognizing dyslexia in a classroom through fast testing. Most districts are going to do a fast test anyway, or they're going to do a star test, or they're going to do a map test, because we want to figure out where they are. And if you're a QCOM school, you need some testing anyway. You might as well use it and cover two, two areas at once. And so those issues really aren't that big, or as big as we make them sound as a district when we go to the Capitol and we say, oh, no, no, no unfunded mandate there. Well, we're already doing that. It's just we're not taking the knowledge that we're learning from those tests and applying them and saying, oh, that's a sign of dyslexia. Like, I've got all the info here. I just haven't gone through it and picked out these kids. Um, so I'm not really sure that we, we face an issue with those kind of laws. We, f we face more issues with the unfunded mandates that we get for other things, taking money away from what we could use for kids, not just dyslexic kids, but the kids in the gifted and talented programs, right? Those kids struggle too. So that's, that's where our biggest issues are. Rachel Berger. What areas is DDMN working towards this year and how can people help? Can we go the power, can we add the constituent thing into that first? Because yep. I think it'll lend. Yep. All right. <coughs> I got my questions ahead of time. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to talk to you about the power of constituents just briefly because it will roll nicely into that next question that Erin has, has in terms of what we're working towards and how people can help. Um, and I just want to talk to you, you know, again, Roger kind of touched on this, but our elected officials are elected by constituents. That's all of us here. And that's a pretty powerful fact. And when you take that fact and put that towards action, we as a unit can impact very meaningful change. And that's something that we're doing right now. It's taken a while to build that momentum. But we have done that. And we've also you know, done an incredible job building inroads, and I'll touch on that in a minute. But citizen advocates, just like all of you, can be really impactful and contribute to better policy, which is exactly what we're trying to do. Um, doing that by providing lawmakers with local and personal stories can really help them, especially when they're divided or undecided on an issue. It's incredibly impactful. Um, and oftentimes what happens is that staffers will say uh, a personal story from a constituent or someone who's locally, again, has a, a great deal of me meaning and would help on a bill, but oftentimes people don't actually take that step. Uh, and I, you know, that can be really hard to do for many different reasons, sometimes maybe because you think there's a group already there doing that, keeping the pressure on, but um, it's, it's incredibly impactful when a policymaker understands there's a real personal story and there's something that's happening in their district. And I'll go back to a story here that um, kind of comes to mind when I, when I hear that and the first time we heard this. There's a senator who is close by in our area here who told me, I think this was our second year of policy work, said, you know, we don't have dyslexia in my district. And I said, really? Because I'd laugh. <laughs> I'd like to come to the holy land of non-dyslexia non district here. So <laughs> he said, nope, nope, we don't have it. I, someone would have told me about this. And so again, you know, we sought out to make sure that he understood he has dyslexia in his district. And by God, he does. <laughs> but at any rate, again, he didn't. We don't have it. Haven't heard of it. Nobody's told me about this. So again, making sure that people take those personal stories and reach out, and policymakers do want to hear. Um, oftentimes, we've heard from staffers that what happens um, down at the Capitol is they, they're, 
during session, naturally, there's a lot of lobbyists who are lobbying for all sorts of things, but they would way rather sit down and talk to a citizen or constituent and talk about what's going on and impacting them personally than a lobbyist. I don't mean that they don't want to meet with lobbyists, I shouldn't probably say that, but at the same rate, um, what you have to tell them holds a certain degree of, of power and interest to them, specifically relating to any bills. Um, right. One on one. That's way more important than walking into a meeting and giving me two minutes of your time. So I was going to say, um, with regard to that, that doesn't mean that each one of you needs to schedule an appointment and go down to the Capitol to do that. A lot of those, again, think about what Senator Chamberlain said. He likes a good glass of whiskey, so we met at a bar, local, in the district. I mean, hey, go ahead and use that to your advantage. Um, those, those um, in fact, you'll probably get a lot more focus and attention if you're meeting there. But when you do come down to the Capitol, say at rally, that's just another touch point and another time to meet with them. Um, one of the important things that I think, uh, I feel bad for my board, board members because they hear me say this all the time, but uh, Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota, we're working, we're working this, this is a grassroots organization. We're working things from the grass tops and pushing things from the top down as much as we can and we can keep the focus on the issue. Um, we can bring this issue to the table when it comes to policy and um, legislators and other bodies but we, um, and we can be a voice, but we cannot be your voice. That's where we need you. We need the boots on the ground. We need the grassroots. That's why you're such an important part of this mission. So what are we working towards this year and how can people help? Um, <laughs> sorry, guess I'm not. Yeah, um, well we have three different bills this year that we have up and as Senator Chamberlain said, one of those is a screening bill, one of those is a professional development bill, and one of those includes some uh, higher education, so pre-service educator professional development. That is a lot of stuff to work on. Fortunately this year we formed a coalition of like-minded organizations and we hired a lobbyist to help us with some of that heavy lifting. That doesn't mean that we're not gonna be ever at the Capitol, but that means that we can do things like what we're doing today and um, tell our, um, our, I guess, constituents, <laughs> tell our constituents how they can help. So the things that you guys can do to help are to um, respond to any calls of action we put out on Facebook or through the website. Um, that could be we need some phone calls and emails sent to policymakers. The biggest one is uh, if you haven't yet met your policymaker, do so. It's so important. Now, a lot of times people don't want to do that because they're afraid that they sound uneducated or unprofessional. That's not, they don't want a, a polished professional. They want to sit with you and hear. So meet with your policymaker, respond to calls to action. That could be a phone call or an email at a time in which we say, hey, this bill is on its way through a certain committee. We need your help. Um, and when we ask for those types of things, it's really important to not only do it for yourself, but ask someone else as well. Um, I oftentimes ask my in-laws um, when they, because they live in districts as well and they well know the issue. So do what you can to help support in that manner. We also have rally, which, as I said, is really important. And when we have hearings and you have the ability to show up, it means a lot to policymakers during a committee hearing to see a room filled with people who um, are really passionate about a certain bill or topic. Yeah. So that's a good question. Do we have time to do that right now, or did you want to hold? I think that's kind of a longer answer than we've got time for right now, because that's Can we take a that in just issue. a little bit? Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll follow up with that. Did you want to add anything um, else regarding work at the district level or the three eyes? Let's wait on that one. Okay. Let's move it over to Rachel Depa. Any comments on what the school is doing good, doing well? Is there a second question? I think I did that. Yeah, you, you did. How about this one? Finish the sentence. If I could grant one wish for every school in this state, it would be? Unlimited funding. <laughs> a little bit of extra space, too. Um. 
No. Um, if you don't have any further comments about that, I can have one for Lynn. Do you want to fill it? Unless people have awkward questions. It is. It's kind of <laughs> dap up. We've got a few minutes to finish up just a few things, so why don't we hand it to Lynn? What do you hope to see accomplished in our state five years from now? Uh, I hope that our mission is accomplished and we're done and we're all just living our happy lives. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I hope that what has started, I hope that you know the parents that are in this beginning journey have a completely different experience than most of us that are up here. Um, I, I feel like I know a lot. I was actually an administrator and the journey through school was very tough. It was very hard. And it was very confusing, even with my background. And I think that it would be nice to have a map and to give parents a map when they start and say, here's where you start, and here's the next thing, and then here's the next thing. And that would be wonderful if, as a community, we were able to support people when they start this journey because this journey isn't going to end. We're, we're talking about issues of hereditary issues and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's, an ongoing, it's an ongoing battle. So dyslexia will definitely be around five years from now and 50 years from now and everything like that. But I think that, yeah, thankfully Amy's here and problem solved. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't cause you to die. <laughs> Rachel Berger, is there anything else you want to get to before we wrap up with my final um, question for you? Is this your um, the three eyes you wanted me to talk about? I think we could probably skip that and move okay. down to the last question if that's okay. I think that's important though. Okay, cool. So there's something that I call the three eyes, and this is another reason that all of you are important in your district, and I'm gonna try to be really quick because I know she wants to wrap things up. But it's called, in, I call those interpretation, wait, intent interpretation and implementation. And we can, we can pass laws all day long, but then there is the interpretation of those laws which happens at our governing body and because we're local control also within the school districts right we are one of the few states that's a local control state so there's the intent of the law and what did we intend when we brought that forward and when that was passed then there's the interpretation like i said and then there's the implementation and that is where you guys are critical because we have to know what these laws are what our children have access to or should have access to and and what people should be doing around those hey me right and so that might answer your question about screening but i'm still going to make you wait a little bit longer <laughs> everybody's going to be hungry that's why I'm okay oh, wait. what what had you the last question you ready for that? Sure. Okay. She's being kind. We're skipping information and, and being time conscientious. Our country has the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, labor movement, and numerous human rights movements. Would you share your thoughts regarding dyslexia from a global perspective? So I'll share it in a very diplomatic manner. Um, there's a quote that comes to mind from a children's literacy advocate named Phyllis Hunter, and she says that reading is a child's civil right. And um, I would quite agree with her. I think reading and writing are a birthright of every child. I think it's a gateway to a successful future, and reading being the pathway to succeed in school and additionally reach one's full potential in life. Um, Without reading proficiency, we know the stats are very dire. And low, proficient, low reading proficiency is a common denominator of the following stats. 44% of females and 57% of males who drop out of school. That's pretty sad. 
Um, 70% of inmates, 80% of youth involved in juvenile justice, and 45% of those who live in poverty. And so I think, um, I'm, I'm optimistic and I'm always incredibly hopeful, and if I wasn't, I wouldn't be sitting here today. And I think we have the ability to impact those stats incredibly, as long as we are committed to continuing to drive the mission forward, be dedicated, and find that common bond that um, all children deserve to have an equitable education. All, not just those that live in the right zip code. Low, uh, low pr reading proficiency, uh, or termed functionally illiterate. Okay, 44% of females, 57% of males who drop out. 80% of youth involved in juvenile justice, 70% of prison inmates, and 45% of those who live in poverty. There's a document somewhere that, because I, I used to rattle these off when I was testifying, so there's a document somewhere. If you just, I could, we could probably put it up for you guys if that's more helpful. Because there's a lot more stats that go with that. Yeah. I want to mic you, so hold on, because I want everyone to hear about this. But it's so important. My boy's first year at the rally was when he was in third grade. And he wanted to be invisible. He didn't want anybody to know who he was. He didn't want anybody to know he had this affliction. And I felt it was important for him to go. And I made him go, and he saw your son speak. And and all, he was just kind of in awe. He didn't have a lot to say, and he took it all in, and um, he's like, so all these kids have this? And I said, yeah, they all, they all have difficulty reading, and they have dyslexia, and, and he just kind of took it in, and he went with that, and then the next year came around, and he's like, so are we going this year? I go, I think we should. He goes, do you think I can make a sign? I go, that would be great. And so he made a sign, and he was excited to go. And he, and he even brought a, another co-worker's friend with him that also has dyslexia. And this year, it, he, I said, oh, the rally's coming up in, in February. And I said, I have to work. He goes, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, aren't we going? And I'm like, I can see if I change it. We have to go. And I'm like, yes, we need to go. And so I, I have switched my hours, and so, <laughs> so we will show up. So I'm so glad to hear. What you wanted nothing to do with it um, is, is now um, um, encouraging me to get off work to And maybe he will speak year. there, one. Everybody get that? Everybody get that? You know, the great thing about Rally as well is over the years we've had schools come and bring children as well um, to the Rally. So there have been buses that have come um, from, you know, one from Groves Academy. Um, the Reading Center had a busload of people at one year. Um, the more we can do to, again, get children there to advocate, you know, maybe... Maybe another school I know that's in attendance here might bring some kids. I'm going to kind of hold him to that. <laughs> Nicola, yeah, we want. Dyslexic that runs a $1.5 billion company. He spoke last night at a, a conversation about how to get the kids to have lunch with him and go to that event. Yeah, my son and I were just talking about the rally yesterday when I picked him up from school, and he said, well, Mom, I want to go, but I do have school. Do you think Brent would let us go and um, get the day off excused? <laughs> so it's, it's huge. I encourage you to attend, and I encourage you to bring anyone you can bring, especially a child who may not have a parent that can bring them. I was going to comment on what Lynn said about hoping that the, the next parents to come through all of the... I think I better wrap my talk. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what I was thinking. So I'm going to comment on Lynn's, follow on Lynn's comment about hoping that the next parents who go through this journey have an easier time and a different experience. And I just wanted to give you one small little data point that that is, in fact, already happening. 
So I had a parent contact me in the last two weeks or so, and she was very upset, as parents usually are when they call me, and very mad, and, and that's okay, and, and we talked, and she said, I am so mad because my school will only identify my child as having characteristics of dyslexia. <laughs> they will not diagnose. And I was on the other line around the phone. Yes! Yes! This is the best bad news I have ever received. So what I love is that she had no idea that that has taken, you know, decades for us to get there. And so she can be mad at that point and then move forward. But I just wanted to share Can that. Let me give you a snapshot <laughs> of some worn out shoes from the rocking back. <laughs> the miles. You send them miles, miles, right? So the I just, miles that were rocked. I just got, I was so, so, I'm glad we weren't in person because I would have been ear to ear grinning. 